right, let's get the show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to another edition of Math 1108. I totally did it. Christine is like giving me the, oh, I, I can't believe he, he went and he did this. Like, um, yeah, but it's all about uh, practicing how you want to perform all the time, right? So, yeah, let's, let's actually jump into it. Um, ba -ba 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 share screen. Okay, so before we begin, uh, let's do a quick recap of what we talked about last time. There were three sets of things that we needed to talk about, really, uh, when it came to counting. We spoke about uh, the multiplication rule, of course, very, very important. Um, when you have some sort of process or experiment or thing that consists of multiple stages and you know how many ways each stage can go. If you wanna talk about how many total possible ways can the entire process occur, um, then you can just multiply the number of ways that each stages can go. And that's called the multiplication rule, okay? Um, if all stages have the same number of possible outcomes, then it just becomes like an end to the R kind of thing. If there are stages, um, but they could be, have a different outcomes. Um, ba -ba -ba. You can also think about this as if you're creating tuples where you want each one to be from a different, each entry to be from a different set or each entry to be from all the same sets. And you want all possible tuples without any restriction, right? So there are a couple ways you can think about it. And, and you'll see why that's important later. There are gonna be times when we're going to want to think about certain situations in terms of tuples, as well as certain situations in terms of sets, and it's going to matter um, later. Uh, counting with restriction is very important. Um, there are times when we want to do restriction. A very popular restriction is no repeating, which both of these guys, uh, both of the later guys I showed you deal with. But there's one where order matters, order matters and I know I, I should I can probably put it in here and no repeats I did write that down later on but it's nice to kind of introduce that here right so this le led us to something called a permutation um, so this is how we can uh, choose n objects choose our objects from n objects and arrange them in a particular order or to choose them in a particular order. Um, if we want to choose n objects from n objects, this gives rise to something that we call a factorial and zero factorial is one. Um, then we have order does not matter and still no repeats. Repeats is a weird word, repetition. So uh, you wanna find out the way to choose R objects from N objects um, in no particular order. Then you do what's called a combination. It's also read N choose R, right? That's how we, we say it. So you would want to say it like that um, because it's very important to actually know, sound like you know what you're talking about as well as know what you're talking about. So that's how you'd use that phrase. This is, this is, the, uh, this is the phrase, this is how we say it, right? It is a combination, but if we're saying it, this is how we say it, N choose R, right? Um, so yeah, that was that. In general, we can mix and match the above. Uh, be very careful mixing and matching the uh, permutations with combinations. They're very different. Permutations tend to give you a larger number of things. There are always more permutations than combinations. So if you use both of them in the same problem, chances are the number that you get from the permutations part is going to be too big to be relative to the number that you're getting from the combinations part. And it's, it's very rare that you're gonna have the same problem where you're both thinking of things as being in order and out of order at the same time. I think it could be possible, um, but I don't think any problem that I would give you is going to have that uh, sort of property. Um, we made sure that you could calculate them last time. Uh, I showed you this in Wolfram Alpha. I also did some screenshots. Um, and then we started doing some counting examples. I did the hardest ones for you guys, right? These were like, yeah, 
these were these ones were the these ones were the hard ones, and then I left the easy ones for you guys. Um, so group one, group two, group three, group four, all groups over here, and yeah. So now we will move on and do these other problems. Hopefully, we have the time. Um, so yeah, so that's where we are. So you know all the formulas. Let's actually just do it. So let's just jump right in. All right, group one, first problem. What did you, what did you, what was the answer? What answer did you guys get for this? Would it be one times 10 to the ninth? One times 10 to the ninth. Let, let, let me see my notes here. Uh, tell me your reasoning. Because the first number has to be one and then the other nine numbers can be zero through nine. Okay, so one way to visualize this is to just like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? And we know that the first number has to be a one. Let's put that there in quotations. So there is uh, one choice here. And then you would have, um, you would have 10 possible digits for the other nine, right? So there are 10 choices here, 10 choices, 10, 10, 10, 10, all the way around. And so uh, we get 10 to the nine by the multiplication rule. You can think of building the phone number as something done in stages where each stage is you choosing a digit. Um, so this means that there are 10 to the nine total possible numbers. All right, yes. Um, it's dangerous, but can I do it? Problem five, group two, what do we have? What do you think the guess was? Or what do you guys think the answer is? Anyone from group two here? The 96, pretty bad guess, but again, 96, 96. Yeah. Okay. Explain your reasoning. Oh, I just multiplied all the numbers by each other in my head. Like three by four by two by four. Yeah. I think 96 would just be one stage. Uh, so this this problem is a little bit tricky. You have to realize that there is, there are some ors here, right? Which means you have multiple options. You don't have to do all of them. Like if I said you had to wear a shirt, a pants, a jacket, and a tie, you had to wear all of them at the same time. Then yeah, ninety six would be the answer. That is not that's not the the, the requirement though. So the dress code requires that you wear a shirt, pants, and a jacket, or you can wear a shirt, pants, and a tie, or you can wear a shirt, pants, jacket, and tie, right? So you have three possible uh, options for the kind of outfit that you can have. So 
So yeah, there, there, th this is a problem with multiple experiments and each experiment has multiple stages. Um, so yeah, 90, 90, 90. Is it 168? How did you get that? Um, so, I mean, I kept the 96. Yeah. And then I did three times four times two for shirts, pants, and jackets, and that's 24. And yeah. You add that. And then you do three by four by four for shirts, pants, yeah. and tie. Okay. That is yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's do that. How would we write that down? How do we visualize it? So one, we can have a uh, shirt, pants, and jacket. Or two, we could have a shirt, pants. I know me scrolling up and down is going to start annoying me. Let me pull this up on another screen. Okay, so we can have a shirt, pants, and jacket, or shirt, pants, and tie. Or we can have a shirt, pants, jacket, and tie. So these are the stages to make an outfit, right? Now, um, this is something that's going to come up uh, later on. When it comes to counting, if you're in a situation where there are they are mutually exclusive. Um, so we'll talk about what that means already. Here, this is the exclusive or. It, it translates to add. Right, so um, some uh, often. So if you say I can be this or that or that, and none of these things overlap, then if you want the total number of ways for those things to occur, you add them, right? You say, oh, this can happen in this many ways, or this can happen in this many ways, or this can happen in this many ways. You would add up all those ways. And within each situation, you might use the multiplication rule. Um, so yeah, so when it comes to shirts, we have, and, and I, I put the, the choices is, is the numbers in four. Uh, I have three shirts, four pants, two jackets, or three shirts, four pants, uh, four ties, sh three shirts, four pants, two jackets, four ties. So this here becomes by by multiplication rule. This is three times four times two, which is 24. This one would be three times four times four, which is uh, 48. This one would become three times four times two times four, that's your 96. And then you add them. So we would have uh, 24 plus 48 plus 96 equals, and you would have 168. All right, so a solution to this problem would look something like that. So you're writing this out for a test or something like that. I would expect to see something like this. Um, yeah, so again, 
Every time building an outfit is an experiment with multiple stages. So the multiplication rule can tell you how many things uh, one experiment could go. But here we had three different experiments. So we have to do the multiplication rule repeatedly. And because they couldn't overlap, right? Because technically one and three can't overlap because the moment you overlap them, it just all goes into three. You see that? Because you can't say I have a shirt, pants and jacket and I overlap this with a shirt, pants, jacket and tie. Well, that just means you had a shirt, pants, jacket and tie, right? It doesn't, the overlap kind of destroys, once you overlap them, you kind of destroy one situation versus the other or you create another situation. So these guys don't overlap. You can have one type of outfit or another type of outfit or another type of outfit. And if you have one type of outfit, you don't have the other type of outfit. So when there's no overlap, uh, the word or translates to adding, you add them together, right? Um, group three. Consider all three digit numbers from 000 to 999. How many of these numbers have exactly one digit that's greater than five? Uh, what, is, what is your guess here? Group three. No, no guess, no idea. Anyone else have any idea how you'd go about doing this? So you need exactly one digit to be greater than five. Um, and there are gonna be a couple ways, I guess you could go about this, but let's do it uh, probably the most basic way, which is not the most efficient, but I think it's the most straightforward. Um, so we wanna do three digit numbers, right? So there, there are going to be cases here. There are cases. Um, so one is the number greater than five is in the first place. Right? So you have three digit numbers, and this is the guy greater than five. Um, I'm gonna be doing that all, all the time. Greater than five. And this thing is any, any digit. We don't care. This thing is any digit. Right? However, we can also have that the number greater than five is in the second place. Now this is or, and this is exclusive because if the number greater than five is in the first place, I'm only allowed to have one digit greater than five. So I can't also have the number greater than five being in the second place. So these are non overlapping cases, which means my or can translate to add, right? So here is I have any digit this is where the greater than five happens and here I have any digit. Um, and three or the number greater than five is in the third place. So boom, boom, boom. Here would be any digit. Here would be any digit here would be the greater than five, okay? Now, what we're going to do is, of course, we're going to add all these together. We're gonna to take this plus that, 
plus that, and we're going to get the answer here. by adding up. All right, so if I set that out for you, could you continue? Um, let's do the numbers in blue for choices again. Um, let me just do that. <laughs> blue numbers count choices. Okay, so I don't have to write choices every time. Okay, so um, yeah, greater than five. How many options are greater than five? Four. Four, there are four choices for here. Because it can be uh, six, seven, eight, or nine, right? What about any digit? Nine. Ten. Uh, exactly one digit greater than five. Oh no, sorry, not any digit. It's any digit less than five. <laughs> yeah, reading the instructions is important. Because um, any digit would mean that they were allowed to be greater than five. I don't want that less than five. So how many options now? Why did I Six. write out the word five? Uh, less than five. Why am I writing out less than? I should have just wrote in less than five. So now, yeah, I have six options up here. Six, six. So this would lead to, by the multiplication rule, four times six times six which is, which is what? I don't, I don't know. How do you get six? Uh, because they have to be less than five. So it's z less, it has to be less than or equal to five. Right, because the opposite of greater than five is less than or equal to five. So there are six there, zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Right, so they're gonna be- 44. That's 144? Yep. Uh, less than or equal to 5, less than or equal to 5, less than or equal to 5, less than or equal to 5. 144. Now, uh, similarly here, we're going to have the same thing. There are going to be four options here, but six options there and there. So that's going to lead to 6, 4, 6. That's also 144. Uh, similarly here, we're going to have four options here, but six in the other two. That's going to lead to six, six, four, also 144. So here we would just have uh, 432. Um, there is another way. This way is slightly more sophisticated. Um, another way. Think of constructing such a number as an experiment in two stages. Uh, one experiment. covering all cases can be done, but uh, you might not have thought of it this way at first. So one stage is choosing the digit to be uh, greater than five, uh, choosing the other two digits. Uh, 
right? Um, and uh, choosing the digit greater than, sorry, choosing the digit greater than five. Choosing the position of the digit uh, greater than five. So I can go in and I can just think of this as a very overarching experiment. I'm going to choose the position where I'm going to put the number greater than five. There are three positions to choose. Now I'm going to choose the actual digit that's greater than five. I have four options. Then I choose the other two digits. I know by the multiplication rule, that's gonna be six times six. And this all adds up to uh, 432. Uh, by multiplication rule, three times four times six times six. Um, you'll notice that in all of these, the cases are pretty much symmetric. We're multiplying two sixes and a four in every case, right? So that kind of tells you that there, there was a, a shorter pattern here. Um, so you could have done it all in one uh, with a little bit of ingenuity. And this kind of thinking is what would be nice for the other problems, in fact. Um, in fact, like this problem, problem seven, this this last kind of reasoning that I just showed you would be a nice way to do problem seven. But uh, the brute force way to do problem six would be something like that. If you really didn't know what was going on, you really didn't know what the, what's going on with this problem, trying to visualize it is going to be very important. Um, so you just come up with a way to visualize it. I know I'm choosing three digits, write down three slots. Let me figure out how many choices I have. Then you make sure that you cover all cases. So when someone says, oh, one of the digits is greater than five, which one, right? That, that, should, that should be, um, it's gonna matter, right? So, so if I'm telling you, oh, you know, I'm gonna give you a sum of money with three digits, one of the digits is greater than five. Uh, who, are you gonna, who do you want to be greater than five? You'd want the first digit to be greater than five. Oh, it's money for me? Yeah, I definitely want it to be in the first position. You, you're gonna wanna know what position it's in. Um, so yeah, you'd cover all bases there. Okay, seven. Uh, yeah, so for this one, you do have to be familiar with playing cards. Uh, I did put some descriptions here. Um, so cards, uh, you can number them. Uh, they have kinds or values, which is the ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king. Um, we are not considering the Joker when uh, the Joker card when we're doing card things like this. So whenever I tell you a full deck, I mean there are 52 cards. Uh, they are labeled Ace, Two, Three, all the way up to Ten, Jack, Queen, King. Right now, each card has a different suit. So for each of these numbers, there are four different kinds of suits that they can have, and. Uh, this can be heart, spade, clubs, or diamonds, right? So you can have the ace of hearts, the ace of spades, the ace of clubs, the ace of diamonds, right? And you can have the two of hearts, the two of clubs, the two of spades, right? So, right, you have 13 things, four things within each of those 13 things, you have 52 things. So it's a deck of 52 cards, right? So, so uh, beyond that, you don't really need to know anything else about cards for this problem. I, I did put in a fun fact here um, about the fact that probability really came about because of gambling. So card examples are very popular. So you might have taken several probability classes in your life and you, you might have wondered why are so many examples about cards or rolling dice or playing blackjack or playing roulette or something like that. Like what's up with these math professors in casino games. The truth is, this is how this math happened, right? Back in the day where gambling was a very common pastime, right? So like, um, people wanted to know how to win, how to beat the odds. And uh, back then they would have 
mathematician benefactors uh, that they would go to and they would say, how do I beat this game? And the math people would come up with a theory to figure out how to beat the game. And that's how probability all started. Um, what are the chances that you would beat this guy if he had this hand? What are the chances that he's going to roll a better dice roll than you do? How much money should you put up? Right? What is the expected value of your earnings after playing this game? Things of that sort, right? Um, so yeah, that's where probability came from. So yeah, card, cards and flipping coins and rolling dice and things like that, very common examples, because that's where it all came from, kind of. So a deal deal do five cards. How many possible card hands can you get? And what did you guys do here? Group four. Uh, for this one, I put it in the calculator. I put 52 NCR5. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so here it's 52 choose 5. And that is correct. How much was that? Did you got, calculate it? Yeah, I got 2 million. Five hundred ninety-eight thousand nine sixty. Yes, that is correct. Notice that here. Um, notice that the order of the cards do not matter. So that that's very important, right? If you get five cards, you hold them in your hand, and you reshuffle them in your hand. Your card hand didn't change. The order does not matter. So what you're really doing when someone says, oh, a dealer gives you five cards, what order he gives you the cards in doesn't matter. So basically what you're doing is saying he has a deck of 52 cards in his hand. He randomly gives you five. So out of 52 objects, you just chose five objects without order. This is a combination. Right. So that's going to be a very common thing for you to start thinking about with these problems. Does order matter? Um, right. So if you can't, if it's not just straight up multiplication rule and you're like, oh, I can think of this as an experiment with multiple stages, um, then you, you might, you might want to think this anyway. But, the, but here, there's no multiple stages. The guy just gave you five cards. You didn't do anything after. Um, so right now you're going to think that, okay, so this one thing happens. How many ways can it happen? What occurred in that one thing? He had 52 things, he gave me five of them. Did the order in which he gave me them matter? No. Combination, right? When order does not matter, use combination. Okay, B. Now I'm gonna uh, teach you a very specific poker hand called a full house, um, where you have two parents and three children, right? It's a full house. Um, and uh, basically that means you have two cards of the same kind, and you have three cards of the same kind. So it, it's a hand like a full house is a hand like, to give you an example, one, two, three, four, five. You have like a, a, a three here and a three. So the threes are the parents. And then here I have a queen, a queen, a queen, right? So if you get three queens and two threes, uh, you have what is called a full house, right? So I want to know how many possible full houses are there, right? How many ways can you choose two cards of the same kind and then three cards of the same kind to put in the same hand, right? Uh, what did you guys get here? Aldi? Uh, I wasn't uh, confused on this one, so I didn't, mm -hmm. yeah, I couldn't get it. Did anyone else in his group help him out? No, we struggled on this one. Okay. All right. Yeah. So this one I, I would say is kind of tough. So let's actually see how to do it. Um, I would say that this kind of reasoning that I did up here is what I would think of, right? So I would think of two overarching uh, stages. So one way to figure this out. Uh, 
think of an experiment with two main stages. So one, I need to choose the parents. And two, I need to choose the children. Right? Now, there are two parents. So I know in this section, there are two slots. And there are three slots over here. Right? Once I can do this, I would have created uh, a full house. Right? So technically, it's like an experiment with five stages. But two of the stages kind of have a special way that they should work. And then the other three stages have a special way that they should work. So um, now I have to choose, how do I choose these? So now I would go about, how would you go about choosing the parents? Right? So we need to choose a kind and then two cards from that kind. Right? And then over here, we need to choose a different kind because they can't be the same. Like if I choose two threes, I can't choose more threes. In fact, I don't have five threes, so I couldn't do that even if I wanted to. So I have to choose a different kind. Then choose uh, three cards from that kind. Right. So a kind here, uh, example three, and then a kind here, example queen. Now a three, there are four types of threes. I need two of them, right? You have the three of clubs, hearts, diamond, spades. Same thing with queens. And I need to choose three of those, right? So let's do that. So here, I want to choose the kind. Then I choose the cards. Then over here, I would choose kind for the children, choose cards for the children. Now again, order does not matter, okay? Now, how many kinds are there? Well, if we read the uh, problem, we know that there are 13 kinds. So how many kinds do I need? Well, one of them. So from 13, I'm going to choose one kind, right? So that's like me picking a three, right? That's like me picking one of these guys from this list. Right, these are the kinds. There are 13 of them. I pick one at random, right? Now, within that, I have four cards that I could pick. I want two of those cards. So out of four cards, I can pick two. Right? And then you do essentially the same thing. Now, when you move on to the children, you can't choose the same kind you chose before. So I have to choose a different kind. There were 13 kinds, I chose one, which means there are now 12 kinds that I could choose. So, uh, so out of the 12 remaining kinds, I will choose one. Okay, so that's like me choosing the queen, right? So this example, choose three. And here it's like example, choose, the three of hearts specifically, and the three of diamonds specifically, right? There are two possible choices. Um, here, uh, the example would be to choose something else like a queen, choose queen. Now, 
there are four types of queens. I need three of them. I need to choose my queen. You're my queen. John Snow would love this example, um, but he knows nothing, so we can't really consult him. Uh, here, example, you're going to choose the queen of hearts. She's my queen. Queen of diamonds and the queen of spades. Right? Yeah, and then multiplication rule. Uh, you multiply these together. So it's 13 choose one, four choose two, 12 choose one, four choose three. And that I believe I computed to be three, seven, four, four. Just to do a very quick follow up. We'll leave the last example for the next class. Uh, uh, probability of getting a full house. Now, yes, I haven't taught you probability yet, but I did give you a basic definition, right? This is, of course, going to be number of ways to get full house over total number of five card hands, right? So if you wanted to know what are the chances that you would pull a full house, um, that would be three, seven, four, four divided by two, five, nine, eight, nine, six, zero. In other words, this is a 0.14% chance. Which is 0.0014. In other words, if you were to play 10,000 games of poker, roughly 14 of those times you'd get a full house. So you guys play in poker in your dorms, you have that kid who gets a full car, full house every game. Like, dude, how are you getting a full car, a house every game? Impossible, the dude's cheating, right? Like show him something, it's not gonna happen, right? You guys could play 10,000 games together and never get a full house. It's very rare, right? Similarly, this is why they, we rank poker hands the way we do. We calculate the probability. What are the chances someone's gonna have this? The smaller the chances, the higher the, the hand, right? And this is the probability of a full house. There's a 0.14% chance, right? 10,000 people can choose five random cards and maybe 14 of them will choose a full house, right? So yeah, that friend who gets a full house like twice a night, every night, you play like seven nights a week. Mm -mm. Something's going on here, right? And your math friend would tell you that, like, really, he gets a full house twice a night, every night? He's like, nah, bro, something's up. Something is up. All right, uh, we will stop there. Um, try to work on this one. It's not, I don't think it's as hard as the poker hand, um, but uh, work on that. We'll start off class with this next time. I'll let you guys go. Uh, on, and yeah. So I have to go to the other class now. So I will see you guys in the next one. Ciao.